forgot to say at the beginning of the screening, and it's very important. Uh, we do have, we did have some sponsors. We do have some sponsors for this screening, and some of you may have seen them around. They've been to almost every film. Pam Wintle um, and and Henry. Sorry, they're very close friends, and suddenly I forgot his surname. Henry Griffin. Um, they they were around the first few days, and they were really looking forward to being here at this screening, but they had to leave very, very sadly and go back to their home in Washington, D.C. for family reasons. So I thank them very much anyway. Kristen Hansen. at the Fleming Museum at the University of Vermont, and I just started in that position about a year ago. Um, so I'm happy to, to share with you a little bit about what we're doing at the Fleming Museum in terms of thinking through the history of the museum, the history of the collecting, and in terms of um, reimagining the museum so that it can be more um, inclusive, welcoming, and relevant to our audiences. Um, so, like I said, I arrived in August of 2022, and one of the things that drew me to this position is the opportunity to work at an academic art museum, um, where we would have more opportunities to take risks and chances and push boundaries, um, unlike at previous institution uh, where I had worked, the Art Institute of Chicago, which is much more limited in terms of um, the types of shows that were being put on. Um, additionally, I um, saw the Fleming Reimagined Initiative and Vision Statement that had been posted on the museum's website. Um, that's an initiative that was started in the summer of 2020 to, to um, start really critically thinking and evaluating the history of the museum as institution and to look critically at whose stories, narratives, um, and lives are being represented by works in the collections and who had been um, historically marginalized, erased, or um, sort of left out of um, the collection, but also being represented. Um, so those are things that we're working on now um, and that we're trying to fold into all aspects of museum practice. So it's not just about the works that you're seeing in the galleries or the programming that's happening, it's um, at every level of museum practice. Um, so I'm happy to open up to questions about anything that you saw in the film that you thought was interesting or specific questions that you might have about the work that's happening at the Fleming now. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll speak loudly. Good. Selecting paintings 
and I decided to show um, a selection of regional landscapes of Vermont and New England because that's a large strength of our collection. Um, but the more that I looked, the more that I realized that we were li really limited in terms of women artists and artists of color. Um, so I think two of the 15 paintings in that space are works by women. And one uh, way that I tried to address that was to be really transparent um, by creating labels that reflected on um, museum practice and were really transparent about those gaps and limitations in our collection. One of them, in fact, starts by asking viewers who's missing or underrepresented in this gallery, and the answer is women. And I go on to explain why that's, that's the case. Um, and in another label, I also ask whose uh, perspective is missing in this gallery, and, and one of those answers is indigenous peoples. Um, and in fact, one of the women artists who's shown in the gallery um, is Felicia Meyer Marsh, and she's entered our collection largely because of her association with men. Her father was a painter, and then she married Reginald Marsh, and I, I sort of think that her work wouldn't have entered into the collection and wouldn't have been accepted if it wasn't bundled together with the gift of work by her um, father and then um, work by her husband. Um, but to talk about going forward, we're, we're right now working on a collecting plan, which I think will lay out quotas as they were talking about in the film that will be really specific about what type of work we want to collect um, and who we want to give visibility to. I actually had invited, um, contacted the uh, Sheldon Museum to participate in the Q&A and um, was told that um, it's too complicated or... <laughs> saying so I wanted I wanted all the cu local curators to be here yes there's a Or whatever the 
more opportunities for community engagement. So these selections of works by artists of color are not independent and completely removed from the communities that we're interacting with. We're building relationships that are leading us to supporting local artists um, and bringing them into the fold and, and creating lasting relationships as opposed to just buying something and bringing it to the museum as though we've solved a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's there's, uh, there's a question there, Michelle. Can everyone? Very close. Yeah. Can anyone, everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. um, one thing that I thought was really interesting, and I, I like that you brought up the conversation about who was at the table, and that being interrogated a little bit later in the film, was um, it's something that I found fascinating just in my own experiences living in um, Vermont these last six years. There was a there's a, there was such a binarial thinking happening where it was. We want more women. We want more people of color. Um, but then there, it gave me the impression that um, there was a lack of understanding that there's intersection. So then we we get more women, but then we can't have more people of color. We get more people of color, then we can't have women, which then also made me go. So then, aren't I a woman? Then, <laughs> so would I not fit both of those categories, right? Um, and then also, when they did bring a person of color in, it was a man. So then it was like we went back through the hierarchical mm -hmm. structure who we start to open the door for. Um, I'm curious about what you felt about that watching it, and then what has been your experience as a curator, as, um, and please forgive me on my own assumption, a woman in this space doing this work and then trying to be more equitable in this work. This was the Michelle Antonia Gray who is on the meeting board. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that I really struggle. I really struggle to find the right language um, to, to talk about some of the art in our collection and I, I think that I'm in some cases, I'm not the best person to write about or describe the art. And I think part of what we're also trying to do is democratize whose voices and perspectives are appearing in the gallery through label text and through other means of describing and interpreting the works. It's a direction that we're moving towards. Um, and it's really hard to reduce artists to categories. <laughs> I, I, I always, I'm worried about the language that I'm using to describe artists, especially if they're not alive and they would not use those terms in their own lifetime. I worry about like retroactively applying terms to them that don't accurately reflect or communicate their lived experience, and that's that's really challenging. Um, yes. Uh, I just wanted to also look, critique our use of the word quality um, because I think that a lot of our ideas of what is good um, have been limited by, forgive me, the patriarchy that is about only you know promoting certain perspectives and so um, as a, I, I'm a musician, and um, as a classical musician, we have a very <clears throat> narrow picture of what is good uh, and what defines goodness. And um, so many artists now are really pushing that. And for me, it's a deep personal struggle uh, and so when you said quality and how do we make sure that these works are of quality, I think we have to examine that. Thank you. Janie Cohen, the previous curator of the planning executive director. 
Close, close, close. More of an observation. Um, major question, probably, but one of the things that struck me is that the issues that the statement is dealing with um, are a narrower set of issues than the ones that the funding and a lot of other museums like the funding is with, which is a, a collection that basically tells the story of colonials. Um, you know, in a collection that that came about through means that have really difficult stories behind them. So, um, you know, it's a, uh, I mean, as you know so well, um, it's a, uh, it, it was interesting to me to, you know, to see this play out in another culture that obviously is so affected by American culture. Um, but I think that, that ultimately the European and American collections that that were built on colonialism have a you know have a world of hurt and a world of, of challenges and a world of remediation basically to do going forward. Um, so it's uh, this was I so enjoyed seeing this and um, you know it really was it, it was so <laughs> <laughs> Just two, three. I can project. You can? Um, okay. There is um, uh, the scene, well, the, the shots, whatever, of the, of, the, yeah. of the individual who was the art collector who had so mm -hmm. many options. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As a black person, that kind of, it infuriates me in a way because they're just sitting in his basement, they're dusty. He stepped on them, he used liquor to hold them down when, you know, sometimes I can't even afford the art I want, and he's got buku amounts of it just sitting, waiting to, to sell it, to buy it. Um, or, you know, in, in other places, you've got people whose great-grandmother has a whole stash of, say, a Benaki things that they should be returned to their people or should be on display. Um, so my question is, what is, or is there a plan for a more ethical procurement of certain art that you'd be displaying at the Fleming? That's a really good question. I'm, I'm thinking your question stirs in me thoughts about the ethics of collecting and what we purchase and under what circumstances. And I mean, those are questions that we're grappling with, not only in terms of collecting, but also repatriation. Um, you know, right now there are laws in place about things that need to be returned under circum certain circumstances, but then there are also all of these gray areas surrounding works that we suspect or know um, were probably obtained unethically. And, you know, our thinking going forward is can we build relationships with these communities and return those works and perhaps um, support their living artists by acquiring works equitably from them and show those works and return works that we shouldn't have in the first place and that are part of a living culture and community that needs them now so that their current artists can draw on those. And so that's, I think, what immediately came to mind, but, you know, I was also disturbed by the laying out of infinite number of works and just them being reduced to a commodity and then being reduced to something that allows the museum to check off that box. Oh yeah, so now, so now we have one more work that fulfills this quota um, without, without the sort of human connection and relationship to the maker. Thank you. One more question? Yeah, Katie? I just heard my comment to add on to this. And it's not an answer or a solution, but it is a further complication that relates to your question. Um, so they mentioned Ellen Sweet in the film, and um, the show that's at the Liberty Hall Derby Museum right now. There's a big hanging that's up. It's a beautiful work of art, right? But when we look at his body of work, one of the challenges now is most of Ellen Sweet's works are being sold to Western collectors, and while they're garnering future sums for you know, the, the payment of the work of art, the 
one of the sort of critical realities of this is that in communities in countries where folks are from, um, folks who are not cannot afford to have these objects in their own countries. And so the larger problem that Chris was talking about has to do with the market and our practices of acquisition and just this whole sort of cycle, right? Like if someone has uh, a monographic exhibition of their work, um, all of a sudden those works go up and down. All of a sudden they become more appealing to collectors who have vast sums of money to spend on contemporary work. I work on pre-1945 fine record work. So, so we have a whole set of different issues that apply, but the issue of the market is really, really challenging. And it's something that we can't get away from. Um, so I don't have an answer for you. I, I really appreciate your question. Yeah. yeah, so it's not just an investment in a thing that we can have and show in our museum, but it's an in-kind investment to the community of makers so that they can keep and own and display some of their own work. Maybe we should all become guerrilla girls. Yes. Thank, thank you all very, very much. Thank you.